I'm really uh, honored uh, and humbled to be here. Here's my program. Um, I basically wrote down a few topics to partly explain how we invest it more, but then uh, illustrate some nuances, maybe mistakes that people run into investing, and uh, and you know share my personal perspective. So uh, I'll introduce myself and our firm, uh, More Investment Management, um, and then I have four topics, kind of defining investing. I know it's it, at least the way we look at it or I look at it. The purpose of investment management, what we're really trying to do from an active sense, um, how to build a brilliant culture, the importance of culture and investing, uh, and then finally what makes a good business model. And for that bit, you're, everything you're going to learn you already know because I'm going to employ the Socratic method. I'm going to want some participation. So it's a little bit of an exercise how we think of a business model and uh, hopefully you get something out of it. Um, Maybe the just a few other notes. Um, if you have questions as we go, just just interrupt me um, and ask your question. And uh, also, I've I've tried to be fun to make this program fun, <laughs> the slideshow fun. So uh, you know, the, some of the the pictures might shock you. They're 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 designed to shock you to get a, a point across. Even the the terms, uh, the four sins of value investing. That's a little tongue in cheek. Um, so I'm just having fun with it. So um, first one, uh, just introducing me. Who am I? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I still think that I'm just a kid from Calgary who likes trading stocks. That's it. I, I fell into business before I was an investor. I started my own business in high school yet with my, uh, with my friend. Uh, and we brought another partner in and we sold that at university. Uh, later, I incorporated a company again I think we were Alberta's smallest, smallest hedge fund. We took in a bunch of money and we made uh, all sorts of investments and all sorts of mistakes. Um, I spent a little bit of time working at AIMCO or the provincial investment arm of, of the Alberta government. And uh, in 2004, I joined Moore Investment Management uh, because uh, a lot of the things that we were doing it more, just really connected with my personal investment philosophy. Um, what about more? Let's see. Do we have a slide on this? Oh, no, I don't want to show that slide first. Um, more investment management. Headquartered in Calgary. Started 1974. Um, we manage over $50 billion for our clients. So that's a lot of responsibility. A, lot, a large percentage of our clients are institutional clients. Um, we are in an independent firm. You might have read a little bit about us in the press. There is a, a slight hiccup in communication and, and strategy, and we're through that. So anyway, we're independent, 57 owners across the firm. And I tell you what, it's a lot of fun uh, guiding your own career, being part of a, an ownership group. Um, Risk. One of the ways that we look at risk is um, is not impairing our clients' capital. That's that's what we're about. There's there's going to be volatility. We run unhedged equity portfolios, and that's really not risk for us. Risk is if you, if a company borrows too much, makes a bad investment, you lose fifty percent on that investment. That's risk. That's what you want to avoid. Um, we have made significant strides to go global. So offices in Calgary, in Toronto. I was uh, fortunate to help set up our Singapore office, um, and partly because our investments kept on going global. So this is part of um, my message or mandate too. I want investors across Canada and over the world to, to have resilient portfolios, portfolios that bounce back. Um, and for us, going global, you know, global small cap, global equity, uh, and the expansion of the firm that way has meant uh, not only more investment opportunities, but I, we believe more diversification and resilience. Uh, how have we done? So this is just a slide to show you. It's, it's kind of a real-time experiment. This is a fund that 
I helped start back in, I guess, 2007. Um, and I've, I've listed out the, you know, returns. These are gross of fees compared to uh, our global small cap benchmark. They include the, the wisdom and intellect of our entire team. Um, and, uh, you know, more recently, um, my colleague Christian Deckert uh, has taken over as lead portfolio manager. Um, but I wanted to show you this because, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still a work in progress. You know, you have this idea that maybe you can beat the market if you employ a fundamental system. Um, and, you know, 11 years later, uh, clearly we've done that in, in this asset class. And uh, the, the excitement doesn't die to try to go to the next regime and, uh, and create value for your clients. So um, that's just uh, the introduction. I want to switch now to investing. What is investing? And um, I have a, an analogy here that maybe builds on just the difference between investing and speculation. How many of you have heard of the concept of entropy? A few scientists in the room. So I think that's the second law of thermodynamics. Is that right? It's the idea that hot or if heat flows from hot to cold, not the reverse. The system of the universe. Um, it's a, if you, if you, another analogy would be if you take a bottle of perfume and if you open that up, leave it in a room, what happens? That perfume, those molecules disperse. That's kind of what happens under entropy. Entropy for me is when, what is the end state, the steady state of something? And I think this is such a powerful concept when you think about investing is whenever you make a fundamental decision, I mean, not only are you trying to, to beat the market with what you perceive as a you know, scientific, as much scientific as possible difference in, in what you're looking at, you want that investment to be reduced to just a function of time. I think that's the purest form of investing where it doesn't matter what happens as a function of time. You achieve your return, and you beat the market. Uh, this is the tongue-in-cheek part of the, the presentation. Remember what entropy is. My colleague has named this dog shit and weeds. If you leave your, your lawn alone, that's where it naturally tends to. That's entropy. Um, in, there's a very graphic photo up there. <laughs> I don't want to leave that up there. Maybe we'll, we'll go back to the beautiful performance. <laughs> um, so that, that this concept of entropy and, and pure investing, that's very different than speculation. And this, in, in, in speculating, you can get caught up in all sorts of things that maybe you shouldn't as a quote-unquote value investor. Um, and that might be worrying about what the Fed is doing. What did the Fed do the other day? They paused, and now there's stories about they've done a U-turn on rates, or maybe you're concerned or not concerned with, with China. There's all, sorts, there's all sorts of reasons to build an investment thesis, and the risk is that you speculate. And so that leads us to um, what I'm calling the first sin of value investing is, are you a closet speculator? Do you do, you do your fundamental value work, and but then really you're – you get tricked by focusing on some narrative that's driving your decision, as opposed to entropy, where you're just waiting for time to play out. So, um, yeah, is your investment thesis based on something else happening where you don't have a reasonable basis? Um, I think that's a big challenge for, for investors. Um, what periods lead to a greater or lesser investment? This is a question. George asked this question for me, and I thought there's a risk here that in answering this question for all value investors that you end up market timing. Now is the time to invest, or now is the time to not invest. Um, and I, I think that the way that, the way, well, there's two ways that we approach it. The first thing 
that I wanted to show you. We're going to buzz past that photo. Uh, this is my drawing, by the way. This is the real, I think these are real, rate of returns uh, on farmland over a thousand years. Uh, and actually, there's a, there's a book that you can, like, this is out, there is real data behind this, but I was just drawing quickly. This book, if you're interested, it's called A Farewell to Alms, A Brief Economic History of the World by Gregor, Gregory Clark. Um, but my point here is just a commentary on the cost of capital and how it's, you know, looking at farmland, it's come down over time. And I've, I'm, I'm kind of challenging people to think about what your cost of capital actually is. Do you actually know precisely what your cost of capital should be when you're valuing an investment? You know, maybe back a thousand years ago, your cost of capital would be really high because you're financing a, a ship voyage from England out to, I don't know, Indonesia or something. You're, you're investing in the, the South Sea Company and you're worried about pirates. Well, then you need a high cost of capital. But as the world's evolved and you can diversify quite easily and uh, we have economic institutions that facilitate more, more safety. Um, your, your cost of capital doesn't have to be the same as it was in pirate times. It could be lower. How low could it be? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, it should probably be greater than zero. It should be, probably be greater than inflation. But I personally don't necessarily buy that you can precisely calculate your equity risk premium based on the way the stock market turned out over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, did the people that were investing then know what the cost of capital would be to perform that calculation? Of course not. You have an infinite regress problem. So where, where I'm leading to with this is you can imagine just by tweaking the, your cost of capital and your model a half a percentage point this way, a half percentage point that way, and you go from undervalued to overvalued. We should invest in the market or not. So going back to, you know, are, are you a closet indexer? What are the sins of value investing? I, you know, be, be open to the fact that, yeah, you don't really, you may not really know. Um, here's a fun story. These, uh, this is meant to represent a, an Amazonian tribe called the Paraha. I, I, this isn't actually the tribe. I think this is just some picture of some Brazil people that our, our marketing people found. Um, but this, this, this stems from an article from the uh, Globe and Mail published on the Paraha. There's people that were discovered in, somewhere in, in the Amazon. And it was an anthropologist that was living with them and realized that this, these people um, really did, were not able to have an understanding of, of counting. They had no concept of counting. They didn't have the language for it. They didn't understand uh, how to do it. When they went fishing, they, couldn't, they wouldn't say that, they wouldn't know that they caught four fish. However, however the group developed, they expressed um, that numeracy only in goodish and badish. We, got, we caught a, a, a goodish amount of fish today versus the baddish amount yesterday. And you know, so it's, it's been this huge analogy for us at, at more that sometimes we're actually poking around the dark, we're fooling ourselves in, in that we are knowing too much or we're placing too much precision on the value of securities. And so going back to, you know, is now a, the, the best we can say sometimes when we're trying to weigh value in individual securities in the market is maybe it's a goodish time or a baddish time. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to provide a mental model to help maybe avoid that, that error of getting, getting too dialed in and speculating on something that maybe you shouldn't be specula speculating on. Um, and I tell you what, you know, I've, I've tried to be honest with this. At the end of each section, mention my own mistakes. And gosh, I've gotten carried away with things too gotten pulled in, maybe it's trade wars or interest rates or Trump tax hikes or breaks um, and, and probably moved a little bit more left or right than 
than I should have. So it's something to be aware of. Okay, so um, let's move to our second section. The purpose of active management. Maybe that's not the best title. Um, you'll see what I mean. People look at the market differently. And this is, there's a similar theme here. Um, did, who knows about Pierre Simon Laplace? If anyone, a few of you. There's more people that know about entropy than Pierre Simon. Okay. Um, he was a French mathematician, right? Um, he postulated something called, which became known to uh, became known as uh, Laplace's demon, and he said, he suggest or suggested at least that if you were to have the information, know where all the particles in the universe were, and if you were to get all the information about them and figure out their 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 speed and position, the, the momentum that they have, the velocity, that you could calculate with certainty how the universe would unfold. What a fascinating topic. It really gets, it gets to the heart of uh, prediction and free will and all these big I ideas. Um, it's a really outlandish idea. And then later, a long time later, at kind of the advent of uh, quantum mechanics, there is the development of, or the, the idea that became known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that, and not to be confused with the uh, no, a, a close relative, that suggested that at the fabric of the universe, you can't actually measure the position and velocity of a particle at the same time. It's, it's, it's kind of this unknowable fact. There's uncertainty at the fabric of the universe. Wow, that's, that's a very different idea than Laplace's Newtonian world. So I guess my question for you is, well, what world do you believe we live in? Are you a Newtonian investor that believes you can calculate with certainty the way the world will unfold? Or do you believe in uncertainty? So, and this is where we get to the purpose of, of, of how we think of active investing at more. Our purpose is to make value-added decisions systematically, which, which add value or put the odds in favor for our clients. We recognize we're not trying to find the answer, but we're trying to create a process. And our process is simple. We you know, find excellent people, great companies, don't pay too much and don't make, make behavioral errors. That's it. That's what we do. Um, as a side note, we, the way we think about value, we do use discounted cash flow models. I, mean, we, we, I, I don't think that's up for s dispute. The value of a business is kind of the cash it generates over time, and you, you work out that discount rate. Maybe it's you're using the pirate cost of capital. Maybe you're using just you know, your European sovereign rates or something. I mean, but you, you discount that back. Um, but we run Monte Carlo analysis. Yeah, it doesn't give us the answer, but we get a fair value range and we're thinking at least intellectually, honestly about the problem. And I tell you what, I came onto this, you know, uh, growing up in, in Calgary, of course, there's a lot of uh, oil and gas. And one of my, my first uh, you know, co-op positions in university, he was working for a sell side firm and we're modeling oil and gas companies. And I thought to myself, how, could, how can you pinpoint the exact intrinsic value of an oil and gas stock when you don't know what the price of oil is going to be? It's impossible. And so, the, you know, at that time, I was, I was building the Monte Carlo analysis myself, I was coding it in VBA. It was all, it was all very simple, but you capture outputs and you, you start to look at the world differently. Um, so th this is really my, my second, quote unquote, sin of value investing to watch out for. Are you being ignorant of uncertainty? Um, you know, one of the questions I have for people, uh, 
Do you have two new stocks in the portfolio? Do you like that picture? My colleague took that picture. That's in uh, uh, Delhi. And of course, we're driving around, we're looking at companies. And I just thought, man, talk about having all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, going back to our purpose, what we're trying to do, we're trying to, I, I call it reshuffling a distribution, reshuffle that Monte Carlo diagram, just keep on shifting odds in, in our favor, whether it's by value, whether it's uh, investing with people of high character of integrity, whether it's a better business model, we'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, ask yourself, how many stocks should you have in your portfolio? And the thought experiment that I like to run, I think this is fun. If you were completely omniscient, how many stocks would you have in your portfolio? One. You know the way the world, it's Newtonian. If you're back in uh, Laplace's world, you have calculate everything, and we all know that's Amazon. You just put all your money in Amazon. No point doing fundamental analysis. No point worrying about margin safety. Or, well, let, let's take the other end of the spectrum. What if you know nothing about the world? It's like, I know nothing. What do you do? Well, I, you'd probably own a little bit equally of everything. You'd spread yourself thin over the, you know, one over N. This is where I get to uh, my Socrates quote. If you, well, if you want it for, you know, I tell my kids this too, and they're like, what? I get, I, my boys are uh, nine and ten and a half, so they, maybe they'll remember what I'm talking about Socrates. Anyway, it, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing, Socrates. Or something like that. I mean, who knows how it's been transcribed over time. But you know, when you're when you're doing this, you think about well, what do you actually know? What's actually required to know whether you're reshuffling the distribution, whether you're making a decision to put the odds of your favor with that investment. Um, are you just outperforming? You know, you're happy because performance is that you've selected your one stock. You've tricked your parents into paying for school. You've saved up your summer earnings. You've invested all in one stock. It's probably Amazon. And you're feeling really proud about the results or sad or, um, but is that just tracking error? Is this, this is a tough game because you don't know. You don't know over, over a very long period of time. If you go back to our, our 11 years of global small cap, I don't know. How would have that done in a different regime, an investment regime? How would it have done in a parallel universe? What if we were in a war economy? Would we have done the same? What a high interest rate environment. You know, so it's, um, I think the test, you know, what this means for us as investors and myself, the test is if you get a different regime change, you get a different interest rates or a war can, you know, is, is, are your investment decisions resilient? Do they do well in that, that uh, climate too? Or do you have to shift your thinking? Okay, um, are you guys ready for another graphic picture? Um, first, let me tell you about culture at Moore, and this is important in making investment decisions. Um, there's a lot of, and regardless of whether you end up going to investing or you're thinking about incentives and culture for investing in a business or you're, you're doing something else, I mean, this is really important stuff. People do not spend enough time on culture. Um, you know, you might have, you, you might know or not know that Moore is an independent organization. Well, I think you know because I told you a little while ago. Um, but that concept of having ownership tied in to the firm you're working for and being all in, not only ownership of the firm, but guess what? We eat our own cooking too. Our investment policy is basically you invest in the funds that you provide your clients. That makes a lot of sense. It's good alignment. Um, values. Your culture includes the values of the organization, how you think. Uh, we have several values. One of them is integrity. Um, what does that mean to people? Integrity in my 
view is consistency of thought, word, and deed. It's do you do what you say you're going to do? I'm sure we all have friends in the audience who do what they say they're going to do. They, they show up on time, they carpool to school, they're reliable. And then you probably have a few black sheep friends. Yeah, let's meet at, at nine o'clock for a beer. Oh, where's, where's so-and-so? They're always doing this, lack of integrity. Well, you know what? This is really important. Uh, this is really important in capital markets. It's also really important if you're building trust. It's really important for relationships. If you're in a relationship and you want to ruin it, just don't do what you say you're going to do. Invert that. Um, that's hugely important. And, and even, like I said, never mind uh, investing, if you can find yourself at, at firms and associate yourself with people that operate with a high level of integrity, uh, you're going to do a lot better in life, I think. Okay, long-term thinking. That's important. There's a lot of short-term noise in the stock market. I tell you what, in our research department, we don't have a TV on. We don't have, <laughs> you know, CNN blaring or Mad Money or whatever those, those shows are. Um, it is very important to think about the long-term, how to create value. And I don't think... It, I don't think you can, uh, you can forget how important that is in capital markets to make sure that you're doing things that are sustainable. And there's always going to be a temptation to, to take shortcuts. Um, so that's important. You know, at, at our firm, I remember having conversations with three individuals, three new analysts out of school. We, hired, we usually don't hire three analysts in a year. We did in uh, the end of 2008. And I remember phoning, do you guys remember 2008? Major financial crisis, banks collapsing, Lehman Brothers. And I phoned them up and I said, listen, I just want to let you know that, no, we want to hire you. We're, we're building this. It's, the company's on solid, uh, solid ground. And uh, yeah. And by the way, here's your book list to read before you start, yeah. right? That's important. Teamwork, uh, hugely important. Uh, you mentioned before, hopefully, you, you'll catch it in my lexicon, but I talk about our team. I talk about us. It's, this isn't me. You're a lot better when you play with a team. I've been very fortunate in my life to play with with a, a team. And that's a different mindset. And investors, you can play with a team too. Even if you're making a decision yourself, you can find like-minded investors uh, who, who think and challenge you. Two more values. Excellence. This is important. This is important for to know what excellence is. If any of you ever apply it more, and excellence is a struggle. It's doing something that's really tough. Excellence is, is, is going above and beyond having a goal and continuing to try to research or reach it even when you want to give up. Keep on going. Um, it's amazing what you can do. Oh, and finally, clients. The whole reason that you have an asset management business is because of clients. So one of our values is putting clients first. Um, now you might be surprised to know, because I sit on our board, we don't run financial projections. Uh, you know, we don't have targets like AUM growth. We don't have a five-year AUM growth number. It's crazy. What we do have, and it's on our walls, is a a slogan from our founder, Chuck Moore, who says, do the right thing. Do the right thing for your clients. Because if you get your value proposition right, well, all the economics follows. Um, and that's why, if you learn a little bit about us, uh, you'll find that we've made some decisions that are clearly anti-capitalist. I mean, we have some very successful small cap funds. Our, 
our Canadian small cap fund, as an example, has a marvelous track record and we've closed it to new investors. Why would we do that? Because it's a capacity constrained asset class. And we're putting the interests of those clients first to preserve their returns. Very important for us. Okay, other ways, if you want to build a marvelous culture, um, how many of you read Daniel Pink? This is important, again, not only in investment, I think just in life. What really motivates people? Autonomy, purpose, mastery. That's what we can provide our people. The purpose, we want to rid the world of investment evil. We want to create value. We want to build a global organization. Sounds like a lot of fun. Tough. No kidding. Tough to beat the market, but fun. Autonomy. People fight for their freedom. And think about that, because eventually there's going to be many of you are going to be leading people if you're not leading people already. No one really likes being told what to do. You have to figure out ways to align people with end goals. Anyway, that's hugely important. We have a common investment philosophy. Um, and actually, that's what value investing is, in a way. Don't you think? The concept margin of safety. It's the lexicon that binds people together to enable communication. Um, another one, I was thinking about it. Especially younger people, they no longer, no longer talk about competitive advantage. They use the term moat which is what the term Warren Buffett coined in one of his letters. And it was that analogy of you know, having a castle and having a moat around it to protect the asset from the you know, competition. Now that's become a lexicon. It's pe and, and people can get together and communicate a moat. So within your, your culture, so you know, one of our, is seemingly, what an odd competitive advantage to have. Well, we have one investment philosophy. We've developed one set of lexicon to use. So again, it doesn't matter what business it is. You can build an internal advantage with uh, communication. Oh, flat hierarchy kind of goes hand in hand with um, goes hand in hand with the autonomy, really. But do I get to go back to Calgary tomorrow and sit in my big posh corner office? away from everyone else on our team because of my position or title or some crazy thing like that. No, you don't want your investment organization. You don't want to think like that. No one has a lock of knowledge. So when you're making investment decisions, it doesn't matter who's giving you insight or perspective, you want to include that. The more cognitive diversity, the better. So that's why we have an open office environment. I sit right in the middle, have the same desk as everyone else. Summer student can come up to us, to come up to me and challenge whatever idea we have. You have to build uh, a meritocracy when it comes to information and exchanging ideas. So those are some of the ways that we've thought about building uh, a brilliant culture. Um, you know, the punchline, okay, I'll prepare for the graphic slide. Uh, the the punchline, you, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where there's a lot of hierarchy and where basically the emperor is so oblivious to everyone he's working with that uh, no one, everyone's scared to tell him that he's not wearing clothes. It's a graphic slide. Where I like that one better. Um, so yeah, this is, this is my third sin of value investing that I'm proposing, that are you trying to beat the market by yourself? Or are you using a team? I think everyone has blind spots and everyone can use a check or a balance. Maybe it's only a, a couple people that you get along with well, you have the same lexicon, they challenge you. Uh, but I think that's extremely important. Oh, there's one more important thing, I think. 
and aside from teammates that, that mitigate errors. Um, and I think this is underappreciated. I have a different view on this anyway. Um, have you, has anyone read The Wisdom of Crowds? A book that talked about some of the conditions being diversity, independence, and decentralization, and aggregation in, in bringing together you know, a good decision. Well, I tell you what, the stock market itself is the greatest aggregation system in the world. The stock market, despite at times being inefficient, does provide information, I believe. So if, if the stock market is telling you something, even though the, there might be some inefficiencies, my personal view is you pay attention to it, just the same as you would pay attention to the summer student that has an idea who's sitting beside you in the cubicle. So maybe there's a good idea there. I mean, there's no lock on knowledge. Don't think you know it all. Um, I was reminded, you know, personal investing mistakes uh, significantly when I was in Singapore. And at the time, I'm, I'm still co-managing. I'm still the lead manager of our, our global small cap fund with my colleague. And, um, you know, my partner certainly focused a lot more of his efforts on accounting forensic accounting, the cleanliness accounting. And, uh, you know, luckily, I listened to him. <laughs> on, on, on several occasions, you know, he's made our track record really good and bailed me out um, and because of the system. So, yeah, when someone offers a different perspective, I would say rather than jump to defend your own thesis or perspective, really understand what that other person is trying to say. Okay. Um, oh, now it's time for just a brief commercial. Um, and that is, if anyone down the road is interested in joining, in joining more investment management, I do want to let you know it's tough. If it sounds like mission impossible for what we're trying to do, it probably is, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Anyway, that's just a mild commercial. Um, Okay, um, oh, I'm gonna skip past this graphic picture and ah, going concern. This is, this is a picture of a lawnmower. That should be self-evident. And the reason it is because I started a lawnmower, lawn, lawn mowing company with my friend in high school, which was one of the best experiences I had just starting a business because you just have to learn all aspects of the business even if, if it's a simple business like this. And one of the, the things that, well, there's a couple of things that we learned out of this that I've applied to investing. The first was the, um, the difference between the different revenue streams we had. There is a revenue stream where we would sign a customer up for mowing their grass over the summer. And I know there's only like three or four five weeks of summer in Canada. Um, but you still had continuity over that contract over the summer. It's probably more like eight weeks. That differed greatly from, say, a, uh, a more project-based piece of revenue. When we got into landscaping, that was lumpy. And if we booked a piece of revenue in our, our income statement, um, we had no idea when the next landscaping gig would be. We'd sawed someone's lawn. We'd booked the revenue. There was less continuity. So there's this huge revelation as an investor that, wait a minute, some revenue is reoccurring. Some is project-based. You have to look at this differently. The risk return on this is completely different. There's, there's one other experience that we had, and this kind of piggybacks on the last comment, but when we sold the business and we sold it, uh, to my friend, uh, we sold it at more than book value. At the time, I was really happy, and I was young enough that I hadn't even taken accounting classes, so we didn't depreciate any of our assets. So it, um, it wasn't very much money, uh, but it was enough that got me thinking, um, this might be a sin of value investing itself, um, but it got me thinking about the fact that I sold this business, my partner sold this business to our friend at a, 
at a premium to book value or undepreciated book value, um, well, the business couldn't have been worse more or less at book in my hands, in my partner's hands, versus in the, the partner that, or our friend that bought it, now marked as, you know, he obviously had some intangible, uh, some goodwill on his books. But it was a, an, an important lesson for me because this value, the value of this company, whatever it was, had to be valued as a going concern. And it was independent from either states of accounting. It was based on how much cash flow to invest and whether we continued to get, I don't know, the Boston pizza contract or whatever it was. And the reason I say this is almost a, a, uh, a sin of value investors is I think a lot of value investors missed this turn or evolution in the market as things started trading at higher price to book values, as the economy became more service-based, as the intangibles and customer relationships um, became worth more. And if you got too focused on price to book ratios, you may have missed some great opportunities uh, on, with investments that were still, still very valuable. So anyway, I, I believe that the, the four sin of quote unquote sin of value investing is are you forgetting to understand the business as a going concern or are you still looking at things from a net net the kind of dead basis which you can make great money at don't get me wrong um, this this idea of um, you know thinking about the business and the business model this was furthered by um, some reading I did of a presentation um, by Thomas Caldwell. Does anyone know who, who that is? I've never met that. You know, I, this is he. He was putting together. He was buying exchange share exchange chairs when the exchanges were were selling chairs and starting to buy stock in exchanges. And he had a public vehicle. I'm not sure what he's doing now, but I remember reading his presentation and he had a really profound insight that I thought he, and his argument or his thesis was well we're investing in exchanges because they have an advantage by function of the business itself stock exchanges have a bit of a network effect there's a competitive advantage there and stock exchanges don't require much capital to grow it's not capital intensive. The advantage there, and um, stock exchanges kind of tax the market without having to raise prices and kind of ask whether they can raise prices to their cut. They just they, just, they clip their fee on a lot of part a, a lot of the business. And uh, so I thought, well, what a fantastic concept is concept of business models having a functional advantage by function of the very the business it could be a better or a worse business and so that got me thinking about how to look at this scientifically or on a first principles basic uh, basis uh, looking at business models so now i wanted to do an exercise with you and this is something that i've done before with our analysts that, that join us um, I, and the exercise is I want to run through the income statement and balance sheet lines of a company. You guys are going to pick the company. And we're going to start at the, income, the revenue of the income statement, and we're just going to ask questions to, get, to, to understand, goodish or baddish, whether this business model is any good. And we're going to build this out. So the first thing we need to do this is a company example. I need someone to volunteer a company that they're looking at, they know something about, or even if you don't, that's okay. Who has an example? Yes. McKesson. McKesson. Are they a consulting company? Pharma distribution. Okay. McKesson. I don't know much about it. This is fun. Um, McKesson. So let's start at the income statement. 
what would be the first question you ask about the revenue of McKesson? It's a kind of a functional type of question. What would you want to know? McKesson. Yes. Sustainability. Rowing. There's a couple of different. And sustainable. Sustainable. It goes up, up and down, or it just goes in trends. Okay, I'm going to break apart a couple of these because I think they're important. Those are good ideas. Asset life. So the asset life of the revenue stream. Is it possible that some businesses will only be around for five years, the revenue stream? Is that maybe what you mean by sustainability? And some are 100 years. Is that possible? Let's get, just as, to illustrate that, I know we're talking about McKesson, but let's talk about, I don't know, Union Pacific Railroad, which was, in, I think, signed in by Abraham Lincoln in 1862. And yes, they went bankrupt, I think, in 1893 or something like that. But they're still around as a railroad company earning revenue. But there probably are a few tech companies that, we would have less confidence in, wouldn't we? So asset life. So that's that's one. Now you said volatility. So that you, the word that I might well, there might be a few elements here. How about well, seasonality? We may prefer, you know, clearly we prefer a business model that has longer asset life, revenue wise, than one that's short. Now seasonality. If it was seasonal, we would have to understand that. We'd have to factor that in, at least understand what we're dealing with so we don't get tricked. Drawing a straight line off here is, we get seasonality. Um, but maybe another question I have, volatility, could you mean visibility? So by volatility, I actually meant like the second level. Cyclical. Is it cyclical? That's a great question. You probably, well, you, you, you would probably be indifferent to a cyclical company other than the fact you might make an error. That, that same thing, so the error is amplified. Okay, we had one other question. Yeah. So, uh, what's the source of revenue? Is it a product or a service? Okay, good. Good. Why, why make a difference functionally? Lots of directions we can go with this. It part of it sounds like asset life, but maybe it depends. On, let me just twist that product life cycle. What if you're providing your 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 product? into another product. What if, what if you are, I don't know, creating some sort of electronic device that's part of a healthcare system where you're baked in and you know you're approved for seven years? Would you rather have that or something that can be switched out? That might be attractive. What else, what other application? You're, you're very close on something. What do we want to know about that revenue stream? Stable. So the the word I think I'm I'm going back to my lawn example. Recurring versus project. Uh, how many people want to buy a construction company in a, in a market? Does he own a construction company? <laughs> How many people want to buy a construction company in a market, a housing where a housing market is rolling over, where you're the construction you do project based, you're doing homes. There's lots of homes or something. I'd rather have a recurring revenue stream. What else? What are the questions? We're still in the revenue line. Uh, yeah, so like what I also understand is my customer dealing with that. Ah. 
I think you're, I think you're on a two ideas there. Uh, so captive, you can create kind of a bad business model and make it slightly into a good business model, but you should be creating a captive situation. How many of you have been to a restaurant? Anyone? That should be everyone. If you haven't, if you're like crawling under a rock or something. Yeah, restaurants, um, the, the challenge with restaurants is you can go to any restaurant. We had dinner, we could have gone to, I don't know, any number of restaurants. You could have fed me McDonald's and saved some money. Um, but you can, you can tweak that. I remember being in Italy. They have, is it, is it Auto Grill, the company? that they have all their restaurants in the, at the gas station stops. So you're on the tour bus and you get dropped off and you're like, well, look, what, what restaurant should we go to? How about this one? Cause it's the only one here. What about business strategy? Who knows about Stanley Ma and MTY foods in Canada? What do they do? Uh, so MTY is kind of the house of brains that has a lot of the food court. Uh, yeah. And why food courts? Uh, because of traffic. Exactly. Captive customer. So would you rather have a captive customer, a business model with a captive customer? No, I'd go the captive customer route. Now you mentioned, you mentioned something else that was interesting. Habitual buying. Habitual buying. I'm gonna twist that a little bit. So that, well, there's outright addiction. I, I'd rather be, uh, I mean, Coke, arguably, like that's addiction, coffee, is addiction. I'm starting to shake now. I haven't had a coffee for half an hour, right? So yeah, maybe you want to be addicted, but you can get into trouble too. Um, if you think about what have, if your business model is designing video games, like some, there's some big players in China that, that do video games and you create too much addiction. There's, I'm surprised any of you are here. You should be out playing Fortnite or something. No, there's, there's someone, someone is missing because that's actually what they're doing. So you're, you're, you're right on that. Um, but you also mentioned, okay, habitual. Why would something have to be habitual? Because it's a purchase decision. So are there some revenue streams where the per, there's many, 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 many purchase decisions versus others where well, you, you just, you wouldn't revisit that decision for like 10 years. That's kind of the investment management business. I mean, how often do you, if you're, if you're invested, I don't know, in RRSPs, you've bought something, how often do you revisit that decision versus, you know, going back to, uh, going to a restaurant? The restaurant decision is all the time. It's all the time. There's a difference in business model. One is structurally better. Yes, at the back. Understand the concentration of clients. So I really do want to have just one customer. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. If your business model is, and why is that important? Uh, because that's very high business risk. If I manage to uh, upset that one customer, then I might, my revenues might be zero tomorrow. Good. Very good. So there's the risk of losing that that customer. But what else can they do to you? Why else is they can also put pricing pressure on me because they know that I'm highly dependent on them. Yeah, yeah. That's why George diversifies his speaker list so he doesn't. He's, he's keeping costs to a minimum. Um, yeah. What else? What else would be? That, that I just I want to follow that train of thought. You have a. You have a product or service. Would you, if, if given the choice of business models, would you rather be selling something to someone that's high cost or low cost? But but by cost, I mean I mean size. Like if you're if if I was without knowing anything else about the businesses, yeah. uh, Ceteris Paribus, I guess is the Latin for it. Would you rather be selling BMWs or some other expensive car? I don't know, I've been using BMWs a lot as an example. Or would you rather be selling big pens? So, pens are successful. And? I would 
make a decision based on just that parameter. I'm going to make you make a decision on that parameter. <laughs> okay, uh, if I was to compare a Walmart with a high-end retailer, uh, I'd rather be a Walmart because I'm appealing to more audience. No, I'm, a, I'm, I'm talking about that exact okay. product. One costs $40,000, one costs 35 cents. I would think just because I uh, my revenue stream would be much more smoothed out because of the even the economic cycles, I may not buy a BMW, but I have to buy that twenty five cent pen. Maybe, yeah. The, the the thirty five the cost. The point is, how many of you have spent a lot of time to analyze the costs of buying a car? Anyone bought a car? You spent tons of time. I've spent hours. I've lost like. I, like if when I and I buy used cars, I bought a used truck. Is in, in Alberta we drive pickup trucks, um, and I bought a I bought a used car once. I spent hours doing this. Why? Because they're expensive. How much time have I spent analyzing how much a big pen costs? Zero, zero. Because it because it doesn't hit. It doesn't make a difference to my bottom line. So from the perspective of a, a, a company's customer, you use this mental test. If they've hired someone specifically in procurement to manage those costs, you'd rather not be there versus someone that says, yeah, we need this product and it's, it's not going to cost very much. And I know there's different directions you can go with the, the big pen BMW example, which maybe wasn't the best example in the first place. but. What else? What other what other questions do we ask on revenue? Yes. It's a very basic and obvious one, but I'd also like to know how big is the revenue. Going back to your question, is it worth my time or not? How big is the revenue? Ex expand on that idea. So for example, if I'm an investment firm and I'm a huge investment firm, I need to ensure that the companies I'm looking at are big enough. About, like, companies that you're investing in? Yeah. The size of the company, the size of the revenue. Rather have a, a big revenue versus small revenue? If I'm too big, like uh, Warren Buffett, so I need to have a huge investment company. A certain filter that I keep in mind before even selecting the companies that I look at. Some of the small caps to be high growth may not really work. I think it's. Um... Would it be revenue that matters or maybe opportunity, expansion? So you get a big big revenue or small revenue. I don't know. It's a big tech companies that have big revenue. Well, I think definitely opportunity. But as a base filter, I might want to know, okay, 10 or 100 million dollars is my base revenue to look at and beyond that I look at the opportunity. What else? Yes. How much the revenue is related to policy changes, such as uh, for like, um, like for example, Huawei is like sort of oh. by the yeah. United States, and also like the Canada is just something licensed. So right. like, you have to consider, you have to consider how these. Yeah, that's uh, we call that stroke of the pen risk. How much of that revenue stream is actually in your control versus someone else's? I'd rather have a revenue stream that is not in someone else's where they can just go, we're not doing that anymore. That's a great one. What else? What about, um, I could do this forever, by the way. We're just, more, okay, we got one. Where the cash flow is. You know, that's, yeah, no, that's great. Okay, that's, would you rather ha own, invest in a company that the cash is paid up front or the cash is paid a year down the road? Schools are a racket. Does, who pays their tuition at the end of semester? Anyone? Is you, are you paying your parents back? or <laughs> At least when I went, I don't know, maybe it has to <laughs> You, can, you, you register, you, you send a check. You don't even know if the class is going to be any good. <laughs> I'm surprised that one got a laugh. Um, there are other business models where, no, you don't get that cash. We, we, we own this law firm in Australia, 
It was called uh, Slater and Gordon. And that story ended up badly. We, we sold it uh, early to manage risk. And um, they, their business model was they would, they would take, I was a public law firm, they would take clients on, but then they would uh, work on a um, no win, no fee basis. So they're, by the time they went through the court process and then collect the settlement and the client got and they got paid, it was 300 some days before they got their cash flow. Well, all else equal, would you rather have that business or one that gets paid up front, your school business? Is that one minute or seven? Okay, I can wrap it up now. Because you, like We've scratched the surface of, um, of revenue, but what I've tried to demonstrate is that on a bottom-up basis, on a fir first principle basis, there can be better business models and worse ones. And those can be analyzed. Not, you can analyze the going concern for business. Um, so with that, that concludes our four sins of, of value investing. I'd be happy to take any questions or get kicked off the stage, whichever is now appropriate. Well, thank you so much for coming here. I actually have two questions, so it's probably worth the walk. Um, the first question is I'm uh, a big fan of fund sizes. So I just wanted to understand how and when do you decide the fund size? So is it at inception that I will only invest, let's just say, $500 million? Or is it something that's an ongoing concern? Yeah, it's at the inception of the fund. And, you know, again, a matter of integrity. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the target client base. And, we, you know, we would define... Uh, the fund. Sometimes um, that definition is a little bit floating. So our clients will say, well, if we're investing in small cap, we're going to define the size as a percentage of overall market cap because over time, if it's, of course, we have to adjust for inflation and market growth and all that. Now about clients, I see that that's a very big focus of the firm. I also wanted to understand how you've used new age digital tools to help the client and to increase distribution more specifically. So, I mean, a lot of our work has been on re reporting and our web portal and, and you know, distribution-wise, I still think that we have a, a significant opportunity in that space. I mean, there's there's other players who have focused on that, you know, the wealth simples of the world, um, who have really made that their, uh, their, their choice for distribution. Um, from a research perspective, digital tools, I mean, we've really been working on uh, bringing new technologies in. We call it our lab. And that's more about not distribution, but finding ways to uh, better select stocks or, you know, more importantly, mitigating errors or creating efficiencies within our research process. Hi, thanks for being here today. Um, you just touched on uh, Wealth Simple. And it brought up a question that I had. Um, these robo-advisors are growing in popularity, and I find that a lot of the products that they offer are just simply ETFs that the average person will uh, plow their money into and sort of forget about it. Um, but what they're not doing is looking at the underlying um, valuation of the companies that they're investing in. Um, how do you see this ending? Um, if there's significant volatility and the stocks that the ETF are, are holding uh, change dramatically. I feel like the, the ETFs that the robo-advisors give to their clients could end up having a lot more volatility than they say they, they were going to have. So I think that um, there's place in any market for both low-cost strategies and differentiated strategies. And that's what you see across all different industries and markets. So I, I, I look as, at passive investing in and ETFs is a good thing. I think the the question is of balance, and uh, one of the challenges, perhaps, is the um, the makeup, or the construction of those ETF providers. It's obviously the vanguards and the black rocks of the world that are are controlling a lot of that that market. And the risk would be is if there's too much concentration, if there's not enough of a, a sort of safety valve in the market, you can get a run on the ETF. Um, that so the the risk is the market isn't as continuous; it goes discontinuous, uh, and that could end up in more so in spots like fixed income. So imagine a scenario where 
uh, you have a significant issuer who has their debt rated just above junk and then they're downgraded. And if that has to be forced out, the question is, is there the appropriate people or organizations in the market to absorb that or does it create a lot of chaos? I think there's one other element to the question of um, uh, these, these robo-advisors. And it's a question of how trust is formed. One of the difficult elements is um, people are human. There's psychology involved. And so if we go through a downturn, are you going to feel comfortable as someone that isn't, doesn't know a lot about investing or financial to stay invested and play the long game when you don't have a connection to a person or your, your connection to the person is limited. And, um, you know, that's, that relationship is important. And I think there's, you know, there's both an opportunity there in terms of the technology, but I'm not convinced we're there yet. And that's a risk for that type of strategy. This is coming in from uh, Calgary this evening. So my question is uh, related to what you mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, saying that, you know, uh, my understanding is you have adjusted uh, the way you look at value stocks with respect to price to book and P ratio and looking at more in, uh, intangibles just with respect to, you know, companies now do have a lot more intangibles on their balance sheet because it's you not know, service technology related. So I'd love to hear, um, uh, if possible, what adjustments you have made and how you view these companies, um, if, if it's any different than compared to more traditional, I guess, blue chip companies where they're mostly asset based, which are the kind of the historical Ben Graham uh, companies. Thanks. Uh, so that's a great question. I mean, our fundamental belief is the value of the business is the cash flow that are produced. It's, it's produced, right? It doesn't matter whether it's high growth or low growth. It's what do you do with that cash flow? How long does that, that last? Um, so we put a significant amount of time into understanding uh, that asset life. How long do we think something could last? And then how much money you have to put back into it to maintain it. And that's the other part of the equation. I mean, we only got through the, the revenue line. Uh, one of the concepts that we've developed recently is just this idea of what we're calling technical debt. And so that is for a lot of technology companies. Imagine you've written a bunch of code, I don't know, 20 years ago. You're like, you're, you're a bank, you're running on COBOL code. And at some point to maintain or improve your application to stay competitive, you're going to have to spend a bunch of money to re rewrite that. How much technical debt is there? How much do you have to pay to kind of get up to speed? How many companies are going to cheat rather than keeping things up to date? They're just going to buy back stock and defer that expense. So that's one of the things that we're, we're wrestling with. Another one, and this is a, this is a problem, you know, not only for us, uh, but the entire industry is trying to figure out how much investment flows through the income statement as the world is more about uh, knowledge and uh, I guess intellectual capital. And so the, you know, this is a very risky one because in years and years ago, it you, know, you imagine at the turn of the Industrial Revolution, you're, you're just building plant, uh, property, plant, and equipment. You'd build your factory and you'd produce something and it went on your, your balance sheet. And the uh, accounting change, you know, there was a time where there wasn't depreciation. <laughs> depreciation was an invented concept and to try to square and estimate earnings power. So now we've gone the other way where um, there's investment through your income statement and you're you're paying someone and expensing it through your income statement. The question is, well, how much of that is an expense versus really it should be capitalized in an asset and used over a longer period of time? And then how much leeway do you give companies for that? Because that could be extremely abused as, to start, as, as you're moving away from uh, you know, more traditional like, gap earnings power. So it's a major puzzle, but it's something to consider. 
Uh, you mentioned tracking error early uh, in, 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 today. Uh, I just want to understand how do you really attribute success to skill versus tracking error, and how do you go about in internalizing the skill so that your team as a whole, all the portfolio managers are able to develop that skill rather than being dependent on one portfolio manager having that niche skill? That's a great question. So, uh, I mean, you can look at it statistically. Go back and look at your information ratio and understand whether the 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 alpha you're you're adding is statistically significant and whether it's coming more so from security analysis versus uh you know you know sector sources so i think the the science of that is pretty clear what's less clear is well what parts of the process actually create that is it the general philosophy is it you know individual decisions is it work on valuation is it work on management that's where i think uh we're probably as fundamental investors we're, we're still yet to have our full call it money ball moment in understanding what's really driving this and it might be an impossible question or a question that's just non-scientific I, I was just wondering um when managing uh portfolios of high conviction securities and more how do you view diversi diversification and what level of importance do you put on it well, it's it's sort of a, it's partly a question of well how much do you believe you know going back to our friend Socrates right um, I think you want to be diversified it's it's a balance between diversified to the point where if you end up in a particular economic scenario or something unexpected happens you can bounce back um, but still focused on your core philosophy and and adding adding value you know you don't want to diversify so to speak um so there's there's a balance that you have to strike with that uh we do have very particular limits um so for example maximum six percent security weights maximum industry weights of 20 percent the maximum country weights when we go global um to really save us from ourselves as investors and uh we're consistent in communicating that with clients and actually doing that so throughout your experiences um, over the years, what have you found to be your biggest personal bias as an investor, whether it be any of the four sins you mentioned or anything else um, that you might have developed a process to help you get over and combat? Bias, not necessarily mistake, just mental bias. Um, I think, um, well, it's, it's both a, a virtue and a vice. Uh, a focus on business models that are what I would call complete. So the business model is complete. It's producing cash flow. Um, and so the reason I say that's, that might be my bias is because I have, I've missed out on a lot of things that are incomplete. Things that are being built that aren't yet proven out where the cash flow isn't proving out. So I recognize that, uh, I may have missed some tremendous opportunities because of that, but the trade-off is uh, you may safeguard capital in situations where that didn't work out. So pros and cons. Uh, what have I done to uh, try to get me past that bias? I stretch myself when I was talking about that accounting principle. You know, what if could a company be more profitable if you look at the accounting differently? And there's shifting, thinking about different scenarios and the way people can run their business. Hi, thanks again for being here. So my question is, uh, how do you see recessions? Does that scare you or is it more like a buying opportunity for you? What's your like personal view on like economic cycles? Um, what scares me isn't the recession itself. Um, you know, once you're in it once, it, once news is in the stock, it's usually a good thing. What scares me would be when you don't understand what the change of in demand is going to be. Um, how far forward a particular company has borrowed from demand and how stretched uh, the providers of that demand are. So that's the uncertainty. I mean, we're in a real interesting point in Canada. You've all heard a lot about where, say, home prices are, uh, the debt that Canadians have, consumers have, um, and a question of well, how much more demand 
is there? How sensitive are we for a recession? What does that mean for real estate prices? What does that mean for, for banks? It's, it's when you're, it's in those scenarios that, that we're not the, once you're in the recession as well, it's, it usually gets into the stocks pretty, pretty fast. By the time unemployment is very high, well, that's, you should be optimistic as an investor. Um, a saying that you don't need to be good at fishing to catch fish where fewer boats are at depicts the simple competition theory. And inevitably, the opposite is also true. Where is value investing at in terms of the competition pool? And what skills do you recommend IB students passionate about pursuing a career in value investing develop to be competitive in the value investing labor market? Go back to that fishing comment because I just okay. missed that. <laughs> Something big fish, small fish. Yeah, you don't need to be good at fishing where the fewer boats are at. Well, it, yeah, fish. so skill-wise... I mean, I think that there's going to be a lot of people that are focused on IT and computers and engineering. And I think um, there will be a bit of, we will go through a phase where there's just less intellectual capital in fundamental stock analysis. Because the, you could argue, I mean, if you're, you know, if you think about the world as this strange scenario where imagine the world continues to consolidate. I mean, in the United States, we've already gone from, what, 8,000 public companies in the 90s to 4,000. Imagine that you have more GEs in terms of conglomerates. You now only have 1,000 companies. Amazon, Google, Facebook, these things are kind of controlling everything. They've crowded out... Um, competition you could have this everyone plugs into the black rock s p 500 fund and you've plugged into the grid you've plugged into utility yeah it's low cost you don't you don't have to worry about it that's that's the direction that we're heading so how much investment in intellectual capital is being made to figure out how capital should be allocated or governance or strategy. Um, so I, I, honestly, I, I think that that, that could be an area where, where, where no, 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 just broader fundamental anal analysis um, itself could be in short supply because we're not going to get incented for it too. If you follow what's happened, happening in Europe with MIFID II and the, the unbundling of uh, sell-side research, between trade execution and research. And what that's doing is forcing, which is in itself a good thing, it's forcing more uh, cost focus on that, but it's also meaning people aren't getting paid to provide research coverage. So another area of that you can go fishing in would be small cap stocks. You might go through a period of time where there's just, there's not a lot of coverage and then not a lot of people know how to do this. They've been brought up buying ETFs. There's a few ideas. One more question. Is sure. there any a book that you read recently that you recommend to the students? I read lots of books. It doesn't um, have to be recent, but... Um, and what topic or what, what on, on investing, on history, on... Along the lines with, uh, you know, developing the skills to be a good investor. Books out there. Um, you know, I, I think you should, you should read Ben Graham. I know you have, you should read Peter Lynch went up on wall street, beat the street. Um, that's a great, great series of books for understanding that these things are, there's real products behind companies. Uh, Phil Fisher, uh, famous book out. Uh, I personally really like, uh, the alchemy of finance by George Soros to understand the market. Um, if you're interested in, in some, uh, uh, just a fun book, if you've read, what's it called? Cold Blood? Is that it? Bad Blood. Yeah, Cold Blood is just really bad blood. Um, that's a great book to start to think about how, how a fraud can occur and what you would have to do, how, how limited you are in, in your knowledge, and what would you have to do to really prove something else? Hi, um, I just had a question about, you mentioned on India a lot, and from my understanding, Mao also 
is starting to invest in India. What do you think is like the investment case currently that's being made for India? A lot of funds are starting to explore it and it's becoming one of the most attractive investment opportunities in the emerging markets. So what's your take on India and like the future from the investment standpoint for that? Um, yeah, India, good question. So, um, you know, if I was to put my macroeconomic hat on, so I think they're, you know, versus China, their GDP numbers are probably real. I don't know. The, China, the Chinese population grew at like 0.4% last year and car sales were down 2.8%, yet GDP was still miraculously up 6.6%. Um, I I think that there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of positive culture in in India as well. Um, you know, there's highly educated. There's an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so there's a lot going for it there. Uh, the, the Modi administration has been uh, well liked by international investors. I think that's that's been part of the attraction. They've made some very and for those that are following India, they've, they've made some tough reforms. They had something called demonetization where they exchanged all the bills and tried to stamp out correct or corrupt money. They implemented GST. You know, they, they carried out, uh, continued on um, uh, carrying, carrying out the bankruptcy code, code, which is extremely important to get that right and try to um, kind of unclog the lending and loans and capital allocation in the economy. So they've come a long ways. It's just structurally, I was, I was telling people before, from a, a bottom-up perspective, India still is, a, is really a small cap market because the free float of a lot of the small companies are, uh, are quite low. You have a promoter or family that's in, in charge, and often they might have 70% ownership, and you have this little stub float that is not large enough to be necessarily covered by a lot of uh, a lot of large investment funds or investment professionals. So I think that's where your opportunity is. Um, it's it's a very dynamic market too. Lots of volatility. Very fun. So yeah, India. Also very difficult to invest in. Um, you have to be you have to sign up, be registered, unless you're unless you're already on that side of the border and have an account set up. Just one more question. And in terms of like how you guys screen for like small companies across like different geographies and various market caps and stuff, how does the screening process differ from like when you're investing in different regions and when you're acro- investing across different market caps and different sizes? Well, not a lot of difference. You know, I won't differentiate between market cap when, when we go out to a country. I'll, I'll look at companies and and basically say, well, do they fit our investment criteria? Myself or any, any one of my colleagues doing the analytical work, mm-hmm. we'll go through companies one by one, and we'll put together our short list of those companies that we think fit, that have a shot at valuation, and then we'll go, go to that country, and we'll, we will interview the management teams and try to get more insight into their business model and how they're allocating capital and what the prospects of the business are. And that... For those that have, you know, what we believe is a greater edge, that's what kickstarts our entire intensive analysis process. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm wondering, hoping you can speak to how your firm views um, investment risk and how you might um, try and manage and quantify that for your uh, investors, and if that's different from. Uh, oh, so investment. Remember, if we go back to 1974, when Chuck Moore started the business, the roots of our business are still very much in managing money for private clients. Um, so even though our business has evolved, it's 70% institutional, that burned in this concept of don't lose your clients' money. So we view risk in an absolute sense. And it's tough because we are also realize that we have to make decisions that add value. So we have legitimate relative benchmarks. And that's also an extremely uh, appropriate and 
le legitimate way to measure and manage performance over a long period of time, you do have to add value on a risk adjusted basis where you're, you know, above the fees that you charge or you're not, you're not doing your job. So, um, that's, that's why in terms of process, we diversify and we do all that work with Monte Carlo analysis and have all those constraints so that, uh, from a portfolio perspective, um, the tendency has been and what falls out from our process is it's just more resilient when, when markets go down, we don't go down as much. That's been the historical, uh, pattern and that's what we want to continue. A little bit about management. How do you assess management? You haven't said anything about management. You said I had one minute left. <laughs> I was just getting to management. Um, management, that's where you can really make money in the stock market. It is because um, uh, people are the heart of capitalism. It's people that come up with ideas and create systems and provide trust and, and confidence. So, well, how do you invest management or, or how do you? How do you kind of rate management or evaluate management? Well, we have a, we do have a criteria. So we look at how they've allocated capital. We try to estimate or understand the integrity of management. So that's, that's one of the big reasons when you go back and read 10 years of annual reports, public documents, did management do what they said they would? So when they say something else, do we have confidence that that's achievable, that they can do that? Do you believe Elon Musk when he tweets something out? Maybe he's he's a he's a different management. He's there's um, we transition. There's there's management teams that also have to provide energy and vision. That's actually that what Elon does. His role is different. Um, uh, execution. Do do you get things done? So for us, there's a, there's a number of categories, and I think um, I think you have to recommend, recognize you're still dealing with people; they're they're human. Um, you you're not going to find the perfect manager. It's like it's like friends. You probably don't have any perfect friend. You're, all your friends have virtues and vices, and they plug into your life in different ways. And that's how you should think of management teams too. Um, we try as hard as possible to try to quantify, you know, goodish from badish. I was saying before today that one of the questions we ask on that the culture piece of management and understanding cultures is always about, um, well, what's the turnover of your people? If if you have a good management team, you're going to be finding growth opportunities for people. People are going to like working for you and you're going to have a lower turnover and they should be on top of it. They should, they should know the number. They should know who's left and have a, a system for doing that. If they don't, or if it's very high, maybe you have a problem. You know, on the, on the way over, I did reread the intelligent investor. I figured this is a value investing course and I better brush up on it after 20 years. But uh, at one point, Ben Graham makes a comment that something about to the effect of we're still in the dark on really evaluating management. And he suggested Phil Fisher's book. But, but honestly, I still feel like we're still kind of in the dark on evaluating management. We can, we're kind of in that, that same spot where we can move left or right, goodish or badish. We can use the right part of our brain to evaluate. We can try to evaluate with a little science, but I think there's loads of room for improvement. Maybe we'll get there one day in the industry. So just uh, on that note of goodish and badish uh, and your use of Monte Carlo with, to, to evaluate, I guess, the range of possibly intrinsic value of a company. Uh, so, uh, working with Monte Carlo in the past, I, I kind of understand its strengths, but some of also, I guess, its its, it's crutches, being like you know, like the central limit theorem, and and things basically regressing to the mean. And I guess my question is, uh, using Monte Carlo is very powerful, but can also kind of lead you to a false sense of accuracy, uh, and coming back to this whole theme of you know, like you knowing what you don't know and not knowing what you don't know as well. So, I guess, how do you balance? 
uh, using Monte Carlo and not leaning on it too heavily when developing, I guess, your ranges of potential value for companies. I like how you talk about Monte Carlo as a person, as if you know know him. Monte, when you work with Monte Carlo, my friend, Monte, uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. You know what? The mistake, the behavioral error that most analysts make first as you go through your career is on valuation. And you build the model and you... Um, you anchor on that. Now, evaluation isn't a bad thing to anchor on, but I think it's, uh, it's something tangible that we have in this intangible game that we're trying to play. Um, so consistently over time, as young analysts develop, they shift their importance of valuation to other softer factors, to culture, to management. So I agree that can be an issue. I think what we stress across our organization is that it doesn't give you the answer. It doesn't matter, but it's the process of going through. It's the, the fact that when you build your own model and you're forced to think about the assumptions, someone challenges you on those assumptions and you realize if you move a, a one assumption a little bit left or right, you're your your whole thesis changes um you realize how fragile knowledge is and uh but you get a better understanding of the company and sometimes you find spots where no it, it is good or baddish and you make an investment decision that does add value so yeah it is dangerous so a lot of us in this room obviously have a value investing bias but for most investors with a 40 or 50 year time horizon where do you think they should put their money? Do you think they should be investing, value investing on their own? Do you think they should be in a fund? Do you think they should be like a small cap value ETF? Uh, what do you think a person with a long time horizon should be doing? It depends how much time you put into it. So it, this is really tough. Like if you think that you're going to put a couple hours a week, pick a few stocks and, and beat the market, uh, by a whole bunch, I think it's difficult. I think you, you, you probably, there are some people that, that can do very well on their own. I think that for many people, if they understand the risks of a low cost strategy, that it's, that it's a, a great option. I think it, it, it becomes cyclical. You know, I would prefer people, if they're gonna go passive into an ETF, make sure it's low cost and make sure you're kind of coming out of a, an economic recession when the froth is, is out. And then I think if you are going to invest in and, and with an active manager, there are good ones out there and focus on their process, make sure that the value that they add lines up with the fees that they charge. Um, and that's a fine strategy too. So I guess that's a cop out answer because I just said all three. Um, if I may ask a follow up then. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on US small cap value stocks over time, do you think that after the Fama French uh, research that the edge in those stocks have um, deteriorated? Yeah, I think that's the funny thing about the stock market is um, all of a sudden that, you know, small cap stocks, there's a small cap effect. I'm not sure if that's small cap. Maybe that's just quality effect, or maybe that's a few particular stocks that drive the returns. And if you look at different studies over a long period of time, um, you realize there's a cyclicality to this too. I'm not sure it's set in stone that that is going to um, necessarily outperform. So uh, personally, when I've looked at the, the U.S. small cap market on a fundamental basis, I see a lot of challenges because I think there's a lot of money that's been put in put to work in small caps, and uh, I'd question whether you won't get good enough, just, you know, equivalent or better returns in, in larger cap securities with a lot less risk. I have the last question. <laughs> uh, okay, and I ask this every time at the end of uh, speaker's uh, lecture. Uh, what is the most important thing you learned in life and investing over the last 20 years? It's probably really about how much you know 
and then you know back to Socrates often you don't you don't know very much so um, in life it's made me a lot more humble and I think I've uh, learning about investing because you make tons of mistakes and you realize that things can turn out differently and there is a lot of luck in life and uh, I think it's softened my approach to dealing with people and uh, and, and judging other people.